think what, um, you know, so the book started as a piece in the walrus four years ago, but this, it, it was a, a story about a program in Calgary called Wise Guys, which is a very co comprehensive, elective, year-long sexual health program that it, it's not just about reproductive health, but also about um, emotional intelligence, about um, communication skills. Um, you know, one of the boys um, said to me, you know, which is such a great line, he said, you know, basically we learn not how to be, how to, how to not be jerks. <laughs> and that's, that's sort of like sort of summed it up kind of perfectly in a 14-year-old boy way. To the Harbour Grace excursion with the boys to have. Books really saved my life. Thank you. Oh, goodness. You're too kind. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here tonight for so many reasons. Um, are you guys all right? You guys doing okay? It's a great night. Beautiful night to be out and about. I, I know that it's been a bit of a rough time for Torontonians. Um, we, uh, as much as we are Toronto strong, we are also Toronto grieving in a lot of ways and trying to make sense of a lot of things right now. We've been thrust into the spotlight over the last uh, week, maybe for all the wrong reasons, but also I hope for, I hope those reasons I think are going to turn around and for all the right reasons. The fact that today we're in this room and able to sit down with a couple of incredibly bright individuals to sort out, to explore and discuss something that is at the top of mind feels like a gift. It feels like a gift to me and hopefully it feels like a gift to you that we're going to be able to uh, chat with these individuals. First, I want to invite Todd Minerson, who has spent his entire adult life immersed in gender justice, HIV AIDS prevention, anti-poverty work, housing and homelessness. He is a former executive director of the White Ribbon Campaign, the world's largest effort of men and boys to end men's violence against women. He's been around the world presenting workshops and engaging men in ending violence against women for the UN and governments. He's currently the Director of Communications and Brand at UNICEF, and he is a big fan of the woman we're going to hear from today. <laughs> so, without further ado, Todd Minerson. <laughs> Hi! <laughs> Have a seat, sir. I want to first thank Rachel Giza for writing this book. It's called Boys, What It Means to Become a Man. The book comes out of years of research. It comes out of embarking on a deeply personal search for answers and solutions and hope and enlightenment. In recent articles in response to the attack on unsuspecting Torontonians by a man who turned out to be an, uh, it turned out to be an extreme act of violence to express his displeasure with the world, Rachel wrote this for the Globe and Mail. As we reckon with Monday's attack, I hope we'll have serious conversations about how to prevent troubled boys from becoming violent adults. Maybe we'll finally address why young men have so few healthy, supportive places to express their pain, which is in part because they've been told their whole lives that being vulnerable, that being hurt, that not always getting exactly what you want is inconsistent with being a real man. And so to admit weakness, means admitting utter failure. Now those words have stuck with me. And uh, this book, Boys, explores all of that and so much more. Its thoroughness is a testament to the journalistic integrity of the award-winning author. Boy does what I hope every work of nonfiction will do. It puts our humanity squarely at the center of a big topic, a topic that can be a social and political minefield. Rachel Giza, an award-winning journalist. She's the editor-at-large for Chatelaine Magazine. She was senior editor at The Walrus. She's a regular voice and fill-in broadcaster at the CBC. Someone give her a job there as an, an all-the-time broadcaster, okay? The New Yorker, Toronto Life, Canadian Business, Flair, The Globe and Mail, Report on Business, the list goes on and on and on, have all benefited from a Rachel Giza byline. Ladies and gentlemen, Rachel. Stop it. Dear friend, have a seat. 
Thank you. Todd being ever the gentleman. Thank you, sir. You're Starting this okay. off on the right foot, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> proper, proper. <sighs> so, it's great that we're doing this, you guys. Amazing. It is great. Yeah. I'm very it excited. Really um, Rachel, I'm going to start with you. Uh -huh. Back in February, yes. you wrote an essay for Shad Lane about masculinity mm -hmm. called Why Masculinity Needs to Be the Next Big Conversation in the Me Too Movement. And the essay starts, I've spent the past three years embedded in the worlds of boys, a rather unexpected place for a middle-aged lesbian who came of age in the third wave feminist place. Riot Girl 1990s was that place. <laughs> This is a strange place to have found yourself. <laughs> so we'll just get this off the table. Sure. How and why did you find yourself right here, right now with this book? Um, I have a son. And so, you know, I, uh, you know, when my, when my wife and I adopted our son um, almost 14 years ago, uh, we didn't really know what to expect. It was, we were sort of just caught up in the experience of, of being parents of a small child and um, didn't have a lot of expectations about what it was going to be, but the world had a lot of expectations. And, you know, our son in many ways ticks many of the boxes of traditional boy, and he doesn't in other ways. Mm. Um, but it became really clear that in, in the same way that, um, you know, friends of mine who are raising daughters would talk about um, the princess culture or, um, you know, the ways in which girls were told not to be ambitious or the messages that they're even, even now, even, even in the last decade, that they had to mute themselves, that they had to be fearful in the world, um, that they couldn't inhabit their bodies fully. Boys get messages too yeah. about not having access to their full emotions, about um, finding a sense of identity through being aggressive, um, having a lot of money, seeking power, seeking domination. Um, and I was really curious about, um, you know, could a, could a feminist, could, could a similar kind of feminist critique, critique that had been applied to gender norms for girls, could we bring that to boys? And when I began to research and think about it, I found all kinds of you know, groups that were doing this work, kind mm. of scattered in very, various places. And you know, masculinity studies is this, is this small but burgeoning field. Um, thinking about you know, what does it mean to be a man? What are the messages that men get? Um, how do men perform masculinity? And what is the impact of those messages on the world mm -hmm. and on men themselves? And such a personal mm -hmm. door that had to be opened first yeah. to walk through all of this. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot to walk through, and it's, especially right now, because I feel like it's impossible to, I've already talked about it, to ignore the events of the last couple of weeks. Um, and I don't have to go over exactly what happened, because we all know, right? If there's, a, if there's anyone that's like, I don't know what she's talking about, <laughs> you can Google it later. <laughs> um, it's just that, um, we have this avalanche of questions about this 25-year-old this person who has just acted on their misogynistic urges, went to the edge of that. And we're sifting through it all. And um, those questions right now are so germane to this book. And I want to ask both you, yourself, and Todd, um, I want to ask you how you talk to your boys about this. Mm -hmm. Um, and how you went through it on a, a personal level, because so much of what Rachel has done in this book, I think, comes from this personal place. So I just wanted mm -hmm. to, to, to start sure. Do there. You wanna, you wanna start, Todd? Yeah, well, talking to my own boy was harder than talking to the hundreds or thousands of boys that I talked to over the years working at White Ribbon, you know, because all of a sudden it was personal and it was uh, extremely challenging. And, you know, I think the, the, the senselessness and the violence is, is one thing to explain, but with with my son getting to those root causes, talking about privilege, talk, it's hard for an 11 year old boy to understand of he's course. got privilege. Yeah. You know, like yeah. if I say turn off your iPad, there's no privilege there, right? It's like mm -hmm. it's injustice. It's not privilege. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, yeah, I work for a child's rights organization now, and <laughs> you know I get that back. Child's rights, dad. <laughs> child's rights. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's crippling as well to see, you know, to have to explain to him that some men uh, perpetrate this kind of violence. And, 
you know, he's looking around the world at how to be a man, and you've detailed, you know, so much of those, so many of those influences that, you know, it's really uh, heartbreaking to, to point out to him that some men turn out pretty awful, mm -hmm. and not just some, like quite a few. So uh, that, those, those, when you get to that level, like managing the event is, is one thing, but getting into those root causes is another, and that's really, really challenging yeah. at times. Mm. My, you know, my memory of um, Monday, uh, I work in the neighborhood and um, my son's school is in the neighborhood, was, is on sort of near Young Street. Mm -hmm. And so when I first heard the news, I didn't know where on Young Street. Right. I just knew that there was an attack on Young Street. And so, um, you know, there was the text between my wife and I. And, um, um, and then I remember that night um, comforting him and wanting to talk to him too because this very scary thing had happened in our city. And at a, at a time when... Um, you know, when these events happen, they're so amplified because, you know, the news cycle, the 24-hour news cycle, right. the, the kind of the way in which um, even without a lot of information, um, there's just news, like there's updates everywhere on social media, on, you know, radio and television. And, and being very aware that I wanted to sort of tell him he was okay, that he was safe, that, you know, um, things were going to be okay. Um, and just having that moment, too, of thinking, you know, I, I want to protect him from a lot of things. You know, I want to protect him from the harm that can be done to him. I want to protect him from the harm that people want to see, in, a potential in him. Um, I want to protect him from the harmful messages that he might be um, getting from the world about how to be a man. And so just reflecting in that moment of, you know, how do I, how do I protect Mm -hmm. my son. And I think also, you know, being a, a woman in the world and, you know, dealing with this question of the misogyny that fueled that violence and, and thinking about it, and then also being a woman in the space of protecting a boy. Right. And so it was just, it was a really, um, it was a really hard, I mean, like for everybody, it's a, it, was, it was a really difficult evening. And I think it's also been um, you know, I, I don't delve into too much of the extremist stuff in my book, but certainly it's there. And I also think, and I, you know, I, I know that, that, that Todd could, could weigh in on this, but we know with a lot of um, mass killings that often the men have a history of intimate partner abuse um, that there seems to be, so that there is a, a continuum of violence that exists in a more, I don't want to say mundane because I don't want to downplay it, mm. but that there are these extreme acts, you know, these very public acts, but they are often connected to, um, you know, uh, in partner violence um, or, you know, other kinds of, other kinds of violence, whether it's on online harassment or, you know, so I also think we need to think about this as being an extreme act, mm -hmm. but also part of a broader culture that um, is very angry at women yes. right now. Well, this is the other question is about the conversations that have exploded everywhere. I think I turned on to Ontario today or something and there was a, you know, a, a broad conversation happening. Everywhere you go, there's a conversation. And I wonder from your perspectives, if the conversation is being steered in a way that um, that is going to be helpful in the long run to, to, to get us through this. Because Todd, you and I were talking about the fact that we cannot wait until we're not having this conversation yeah. anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but are we... It, sometimes I feel like the jumping off point now has become... A, like we're a little off kilter as far as where the conversation is going. That's just me. Though. Well, I just read this book mm -hmm. and it's really <laughs> great at laying out um, a lot of these things. You know, I, I used to do, in a lot of my presentations and workshops, I used to start with a picture of um, two little boys, probably four or five years old, um, very close, very intimate, connected, eating ice cream cones. And it was just a beautiful photo that gripped me um, because I think what I would like to see the conversation turn to, the questions that you address in this book is what happens between those two little boys as friends sitting there loving life, innocently eating ice cream, what happens to them in that process from about age four or five or earlier mm -hmm. uh, to 18, 19, 20, 25 years old where yeah. we can have all kinds of different outcomes. And I think, um, you know, you've done an amazing job, Rachel, at kind of uh, laying out the breadth and depth of those influences and also the thing that I love the most about reading the book was pointing out the positive ways that we can reshape those things. They're not 
destined. They're right. not inevitable. That is just bullshit. If you mm -hmm. don't mind me saying in front mm -hmm. of an audience, um, <laughs> it's 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 not right. Yeah. And and you really give us a, a roadmap to uh, explore a lot of those things mm -hmm. in detail. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things I think is interesting that I thought a lot about um, in the book is I think that the critique that we've, um, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to say that everything is okay for girls right now by, by no stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, girl, you know do, do girls have all the access to the opportunities and the support they need? But I do think that there exists a kind of, uh, there exists a healthy skepticism about gender roles and rules for girls. That um, there is the idea that if someone were to say, um, you know, girls aren't good at science, there would be a, a, a big critique that, mm -hmm. would, that would rise up to, 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 you know, to push back at that. And I think about, you know, James Damore, the guy that, at Google that sort of had put out that, um, that, uh, that memo his saying that, yeah, yeah, his manifesto, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I mean, clearly people still have those beliefs, but there was this, just this wealth of evidence and, and, and commentary that could come up to, 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 to swat that away and, and to challenge it. Um, but I think there still is the idea that, um, there are as that, there, that most aspects of masculinity and male behavior are inborn. That, you know, the kind of boys will be boys mm -hmm. um, attitude. That, that, you know, that girls are, are, are that, that there is, um, uh, girls are socialized in a certain kind of way. Well, you know, this, this is just how boys are. And I think if there are parents of boys in this room, I'm sure that they've heard these messages, the, the kind of, you know, um, we didn't, he just loved trucks, he just turned everything mm -hmm. into a gun. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, I, and I think that, you know, I, I think that for sure there, there may well be inborn things, I'm not arguing against, against nature, but I think that there is so much um, both explicit and implicit beginning before a child is even born yes, that right. already sets rules and roles in, in place. Gender reveal parties. Gender <laughs> reveal parties is one, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, so right, and, and you know, and, and there have been studies looking at things like, um, you know, birth announcements. Mm -hmm. And so when parents um, have a boy, the birth announcement is about pride. Um, and when they have a girl, the birth, birth announcement focuses on joy. And the theory behind that is that boy having a son confers status and having a daughter is about an emotional connection and so we're talking infants we're talking you mm -hmm. know so so if those messages are there um, I just want us to be conscious of like what other messages are we you know are we feeding into into what may be some natural na you know inherent things I don't know but mm -hmm. I think what, what we can change is the culture that at the very beginning tells us, tells boys and girls, well, because you're a girl, you're like this, and because you're a boy, you're like that. Right. Yeah. One of the great gifts of feminism for men is this understanding that gender roles are socially constructed, mm -hmm. right? And you have this great phrase in the book, um, the masculinity tax, right? The, the price that we put on boys to, to be like boys. Um, but on the flip side of it, I think one of the things that we as men and what we have to start teaching our boys as well is there's an equality dividend on the other side of that um, masculinity tax, right? There's a benefit to us yeah. to be unshackled from all of that stuff and not have to deal with the boys don't cry or you can't ask for help because we just see how all those things cause downstream problems for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, women and girls and other marginalized groups for sure but also for men and boys. We're, we're terrible at taking care of ourselves. We're mm -hmm. brutal at asking help. And I'm, I'm being, you know, I'm using my sweeping generalization of the day early here, but, but you I, know, <laughs> we generally are not good at these things. Um, and you know, this, this all boys will be boys just reminds me of my favorite um, little viral video almost of all time is a little boy who's, um, it must be a birthday party or something. He's approaching a pinata. It's a Spider-Man pinata. And he has a stick, yeah. and he comes up to it, and he just goes, tap. <laughs> and he looks around, and his dad is kind of going like, no, oh, give it, give her, you know, like, yeah. he goes, tap. And then he puts a stick down, and he hugs the Spider-Man. <laughs> Actually, right? I watched that bet just today. Yeah. So his boys will be boys if you let them. In, his mom walks into the scene, takes the stick from him, and then he walks towards the pinata and yeah. hugs it. So his mother was standing there and she, it was seemed obvious to me that she was like, well, I know what's going on here. Yes. <laughs> you don't want to hit the pinata. He doesn't want to hit Spidey. <laughs> he wants to love the Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> Spidey's my bro. Spidey's my bro. <laughs> why, why, why would I smack him in the head? <laughs> I only tell you this because I just watched it like five minutes ago. Um, there are seven chapters in this book. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we can only touch on them 
briefly mm -hmm. in this conversation. But the thread that runs through them is all about you. Rachel is on the ground for this. This is not being written in, you know, she's not just sitting at her kitchen table just thinking about it and Googling, you know, what might be going on. Um, you go to these places and you talk to um, these parents and the boys and those who work with boys and men and young men. Uh, and it seems obvious, if you want to write about something, you have to go to the source. And that's exactly what you did as the excellent journalist that you are. And I want to talk to you, I want to ask about the interactions that really stood out for you personally, mm -hmm. because there were so many of them illuminated in this book where I thought, oh my God, what, what could she have been thinking mm -hmm. in this moment? What, what's, I mean, so much has stuck with yeah. you, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's such a good question. Um, you know, I think what, um, you know, so the book started as a piece in The Walrus four years ago, but this, it, it was a, a story about a program in Calgary called Wise Guys, which is a very co a comprehensive, elective, year-long sexual health program that it, it's not just about reproductive health, but also about um, emotional intelligence, about um, communication skills. Um, you know, one of the boys um, said to me, you know, which is such a great line, he said, you know, basically we learn not how to be, how to, how to not be jerks. And that's, <laughs> that's sort of like, sort of summed it up kind of perfectly in a 14 year old boy way. And, you know, what I was, what I was struck by in, you know, the boys would come into the classroom and they would have this kind of, uh, like a bit of a, a wall up, you know, the, these are boys, this is in Calgary, so grade nine is the final year of middle, middle school, so they were the top, uh, the top mm -hmm. dogs at the school. And they would come in kind of with their sort of their exterior shell on, the shell that they needed to navigate the hallways and to, to, be, to be in school. And they'd get into this space, and the guys that ran the program were these lovely, great guys, all in their like early, like late twenties, early thirties, super cool, um, really thoughtful, progressive, smart guys. And they would just give these young men their attention. So the young men would come in, and they—it was like watching flowers in sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, and they would, you, and I could just see like all the stuff just drop, like all the, I gotta, I gotta be tough, I gotta be this kid in the school. And you know, some of the boys were alpha males, and some of the boys maybe were clearly afraid of being bullied, mm -hmm. of, of being called out. Maybe their experience walking through the halls of school was needing to kind of protect themselves, needing to be very vigilant in the space. Um, but just in this space, watching how this kind of positive interaction that allowed the boys to drop that, um, and then, to be themselves in this space and to be pushed. I mean, so if they asked questions that were, you know, somewhat insensitive or a bit thoughtless, they weren't called out, but they were challenged. It was like, well, why do you think that? What, you know, and, and to see this lovely method of not saying to the boys, you know, you're wrong or, you're, or, or that's not okay to say, but rather, why do you think that? What, what led you to believe that? How did that come to be? And in that space, them, them coming to these wonderful conclusions or a fresh way of thinking about things in a really smart way. And so I think that really stuck with me. And then when I spoke to the guy who or organized it, um, I just uh, like maybe eight months ago as mm -hmm. I was sort of wrapping up the book and wanted to revisit, he was talking about how, um, you know, the last few years had given the boys lots of things to talk about, including Gamergate. And um, Milo uh, Yiannopoulos mm -hmm. had been somebody who the boys were quite curious about, right? So that these boys are in these, you know, these online forums and in these chat rooms, and they're gamers, and there's this, this guy who is deploying all these, all these, you know, young men into just hateful acts online. And, um, there was this one kid in the group that would always push the organizers and say, oh, you're pushing a feminist agenda on us, and, you know, we're not snowflakes. And, and he's in grade nine. And he's in grade nine. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. the organizer would just sort of be like, okay, like, why do you think? Well, let's talk about this. Like, you know, so he wouldn't let him kind of, like, bully the room. Dominate the room but he yeah. would talk, like, okay, let's talk, like, like, mm -hmm. uh, like, you clearly, like, you clearly are curious. You clearly want to want to talk about this. And then over the course of the year, this kid um, really changed. And towards the end of the year, he came back to the organizer and said, you know, there's a girl in the school who was assaulted at a party by a boy at the school, and the school is not helping her out. They're not accommodating her in getting space away from this boy who assaulted her at this party. And she doesn't feel safe. She's really upset. There's no services for her. Like, someone needs to do something. And the organizer said, well, you're someone. You can do something. 
And the kid went to the principal and advocated and said, you know, we need to look at, like, this girl has been ass assaulted and it's not been dealt with correctly. She doesn't feel safe. The school needs to be a safe space. And so, like, that intervention, mm -hmm. like, that is profound to me. And I, I think that that's what, I think one of the reasons why I wrote this book and felt helpful at the end is because I got to see the people on the ground who are stepping in at that moment where that kid could go one way or with the right intervention, he could you know, become this compassionate advocate. And mm -hmm. I, you know, that is the kind of thing that really, that has stayed with me in, in working on the book. Such incredible um, moments of, of real connection and hope and light and, and joy in the book. Because you might look at the, the title and, and think to, to yourself, oh man, this is gonna be, um, this is gonna be hard. And it's hard in places. Yeah but it's also full of all those things. And um, one of the bright lights for me was Nadia Lopez. Oh yeah, Ms. Lopez. Miss uh, <laughs> Lopez, who uh, is an educator at Mont Hall Bridges Academy. This is a, an, a, a school in, in Brooklyn in a very tough neighborhood, poor community. Um, and she stood out for me. Mm. And she stood out for me because she sit at the intersections of race and politics and class and I think that in this conversation and in the book, you do such a great job of bringing those, Thank you. all of those into the conversation, which I think is just invaluable. Mm -hmm. Intersectionality in this conversation mm -hmm. is, is key. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to discuss that, sure, the, yeah, the yeah. importance of that mm -hmm. part of it mm -hmm. uh, in this, inter, the intersectional mm -hmm. part of of looking at the, these, yeah. this. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I, I, that I did want to ad address in the book is the fact that, you know, there's not one single masculinity, there's, there's a number of them, um, and that, you know, race and class um, also play a role in how men feel that they need to express their masculinity and also how they're viewed by the world. So, you know, I've been very conscious in the last couple of weeks in talking about male violence. Um, is how perceptions about who is violent and which men are violent um, land heavily on particular groups of boys and young men. So we see it in Toronto with carding, um, with police disproportionately stopping um, young men of color, young black men and indigenous men, brown skinned men. Um, you know, just, just before the van attack in Toronto, um, there was the incident in, um, in Philadelphia where two black men were sitting in a Starbucks and the police were called because they were just sitting there and they were perceived to be a threat. And right around that same time, a, 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 a young boy in Michigan, um, black boy, was lost on his way to work, uh, lost on his way to school and knocked on a neighbor's door to get directions because he'd missed his bus and wasn't sure which way to go. And the neighbor came with a, with a gun and shot at the boy because assumed this, this, this boy, who I think was 12, 13, was 14, 13, or 13, yeah, 13 years old. Mm -hmm. um, so there is the perception that racialized young men are disproportionately violent, that they pose a larger threat. And how that plays out in schools is that teachers, principals, administrators are more likely to severely punish black boys, indigenous boys with suspensions and expulsions. Um, th these boys are more likely to be stopped on the street. They're less likely to be um, uh, uh, recommended for gifted programs, um, directed towards arts programs. So, you know, there's also the, the way that there's the the racism and how and how the racist take on masculinity yeah. turns some boys into being more of a threat. They're perceived as being more masculine, more dangerous, more scary. And so I'm very conscious in our conversations about male violence that we need to also talk about how those perceptions about male violence land very heavily on particular groups of men and boys. It's, it's another gift of feminism, right? Who doesn't want to be seen for all the different things that they are? Mm -hmm. And um, you know that, that intersectional approach is so critical to understanding, you know, fun fact, Microsoft Word still doesn't recognize masculinities, you know, it's to get the red line underneath that it's spelled wrong because <laughs> they don't know that there's more than one. Um, write a um, letter. Yeah, <laughs> write a letter. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's an amazing thing. I think the other piece that we haven't touched on as much here, but which is transforming the way we think about masculinities is the discussions around sexual orientation and, and mm -hmm. yeah. non-conforming yeah. gender, gender identities. Identity, um, because, yeah, for sure. you know, when you crack open those conversations, 
um, and with the people who live those experiences have the courage to share their stories, you know, you, you just break one of those shackles of, of gender construction right there. You say, look, there's lots of ways to express who you are, and that applies to everybody. And so that's a really, I think, fundamental shift that is only going to reap positive benefits uh, once we all come around to yeah. it. And, and you say that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, that's something that, that, that comes up. It's a very strong chapter about the idea of gender um, as something we all need to take a really, really good look at and start to shift the conversation about what, what gender is and what right. that means. Yeah. Well, also because, I mean, even in thinking about masculinity, there's like, there, there, are, there are women who embrace masculinity and there are men who embrace femininity and there are those who don't, don't, don't subscribe to a gender binary, as, as Todd was saying. So I also think it's, you know, it's been, I, I think, we, and, and I think one of the reasons why we're experiencing a backlash at this moment um, is because I think a lot of these uh, sort of deep-seated sort of desire to kind of keep us in these separate sort of spheres mm -hmm. and boxes um, have been pushed at recently. There's been an incredible amount of advocacy and, 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 and a push for visibility that has, um, I think, really gotten um, a lot of people super upset and yeah. you know you can see it around the um, bathroom laws that have um, you know come up in various jurisdictions where the the you know where people are you know where where there have you know been you know states or you know districts that have said you know you have to go to the bathroom that is the you know that 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 is in line with the your you know your gender designation at birth and the kind of fear that gets created and whipped up over the ideas of, you know, being in a, it, who gets to go in what bathroom? <laughs> yeah. um, but I think it is feeding into, um, you know, a lot of, um, you know, prejudice and hate and a lot of anxiety that has been, you know, and particularly, and I think, I think particularly around the increasing um, visibility of kids who are, you know, coming out as queer or trans earlier, um, they are being put on the front lines of, of these fights and um, we really need to protect and, and, and protect these kids and stand in solidarity with these kids because um, you know they're you know they're, they're they are really um, struggling to to find their place in the world and being told by adults like this is not the bathroom for you or this is not the team for you or this is not the pronoun you get to use mm -hmm. and um, you know, I think again, when we talk about masculinity, that is another part of it, or gender identity, that, that is another part of these conversations. Um, uh, you cite um, quite beautifully uh, bell hooks in this um, as well, and uh, the book, the, the Will to Change, being such an incredible, mm -hmm. uh, incredible piece of writing. Um, and she says a part of patriarchal masculinity is that men of all ages are encouraged to see themselves as recipients of love, but not as people who should learn how to love. This comes up time and time again in, in your book, uh, Boys, the importance of putting men and boys in touch with emotion and being okay with emotions. I think we talked on the phone and I talked about, did you, have you guys watched Queer Eye for the Straight Guy? Mm. I know, so good, <laughs> so good. And so good because, um, like, I weep during every, uh, during every episode. I wept like a child <laughs> because there's always that time when something cracks in these men, like these real macho guys who have five queer fellas, you know, pampering them and telling them that it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to show emotion. It's always like this watershed <laughs> moment. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we really need to talk about, uh, about emotion and, and how, how powerful it is to be given the permission, which is what I hope that we're trying to do, to be okay mm -hmm. with expressing that. I think boys are dying for that. Yeah. I think they're dying for it too. I think they really are. I think, uh, I think it's contrary to our human nature to, to bottle them up and shove them down and find other ways to, to deal with them, whether it's acting out against uh, others or you know, causing harm to yourself. And uh, I, I just see when, even with, with my own son, when he's outside of that performance that he has to do with some of his friends and in other spaces, and when it's just he and I, and it can be that, those vulnerable moments, like he craves it, he craves it. 
And uh, I think that's also part of the change that's happening because mm -hmm. I know a lot of my peers that are, that are, that are dads now with you know, youngish, youngish kids um, are also craving the need to do fatherhood differently than, mm -hmm. than their fathers did. And you know, I love my dad, but he, um, he said I love you to me twice in his life. And mm. I think both times he was a little bit drunk. And he loves me. I heard somebody <laughs> whistle there. Story of my dating I, life. No, I heard oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Todd. Please. <laughs> I know that my dad. I know that my dad loves me with all of his heart. Right? He ne he never did anything in his whole life that wasn't for the benefit of our family and, and me and my sister. Yeah. But he just didn't know how to say it, mm -hmm. and he, he could only do it in those times. And I and I just see so many of so many people now trying to break that that kind of cycle with their own kids and in their own lives and with the mm -hmm. other boys that are in their lives as well and we see that yeah. in the, the football coaches that you talk to and yeah the <laughs> teachers yeah. and stuff yeah. and, well and you know, I think one of the things we need that we crave it we need it for sure and I also think the thing that I really hope um, men step up and do um, you know if we're going to talk about you know pop culture and fun TV stuff mm -hmm. um, this is us um, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a great piece uh, in New York magazine about all the male tears on this is us and, um, and the writer was talking about the fact that when there is that kind of gushing emotion on a show, when male characters do that emotional labor, it means it frees up the female characters to be something other than the emotional resources. Yeah. And I think one of the things I really hope for is that men step up and take on um, the, some of the emotional labor that is expected so often from women. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think boys need to see that too. And I and I I was at an event um, this past weekend in in Ottawa, and um, there was a question from the audience. Uh, we were talking. I was on with another author, and we were talking about um, the the van attack and the incels and you know these radicalized guys online. And there was a question from the audience, and and the question was, you know, isn't this kind of the fault of of, of girls and and women in that maybe they are they're rejecting these like nice nerdy guys and going for other guys instead and. You know, and I think the question was well-intentioned. I mean, the, I think the question was a, a seeking kind of question, but I was struck by the fact that, you know, once again, it's framing it as it's up to girls and women to meet men's emotional needs. The question wasn't, where were men helping out other men? men? Mm -hmm. Where were men providing, um, like, why weren't men providing emotional sustenance and love to other men? Why weren't men showing up for, for other men? Why weren't men showing up for these boys? Um, because who is showing up for these very confused young men are these hate mongers and these yeah. forces that want to radicalize them. And so I, I, do, I do think that, um, you know, part of this question of emotion is um, I think emotions are lovely and love is lovely and being vulnerable is lovely. And yet I also think that having those emotions are things that often are turned are used against women. We're, we're too weak, we're too emotional, we can't be leaders, we can't run companies, we can't run countries. Um, but if men took some of that mm -hmm. on too, mm -hmm. it would free up women as well, you know? So, I mean, part of this is about liberating men, but it's also about liberating women along the yes. way too, about, you know, giving us all a bit more room to mm -hmm. be more of ourselves, you mm -hmm. know? So, I mean, that, that's what I really hope um, we can start talking about now when we talk about boys and men and masculinity. And you talk about, about this in, in terms of being a feminist, and this is, this is really a book written by a feminist. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, once again, going back to, to Bell Hooks, that she talks about, uh, about feminis feminism um, and the lack of concentrated study of boyhood within feminism. And, this is, and now this is changing. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, uh, and offering the, the opportunity that feminism has, having you know, been through this and been having these conversations for so long and offering guidelines and strategies for alternative masculinity and ways of thinking about maleness. And in a way, I know that I'm putting it back into the lap of women once again, but this is something that needs to mm -hmm. Happen. No, but it shouldn't be back in the, in the lap of women, because mm -hmm. my dudes, we should be. You're feminists, a feminist, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Like Absolutely. We, we we need to we need to not only do the emotional labor, we need to do the intellectual work too, right? We we can't uh, you know we can't go back to the well and say teach us, you know, educate us, fix us. We have to start doing it more ourselves, and that's where I hope the next one of the next great leaps is is more men 
uh, not just kind of pontificating about the event in some abstract way last week, but actually talking to other guys in their lives on a daily basis about what's going on, making the connections between, you know, casual everyday sexism, um, behavior, objectification of women, and the kinds of violence that we saw in the mm -hmm. last couple of weeks and the kinds of violence that many people here work to prevent all the time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've got to draw those connections. We've got to take that responsibility and we have to be accountable for yeah. ourselves and for, mm -hmm. you know, the actions of the people mm -hmm. in our lives that, we, yeah. that we're close to. Yeah, and I also think, like, I mean, to me, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, Chatelaine has done these surveys of, um, of, yeah. of women and, and, uh, and then this last year they did, they did a survey of men. And it's interesting, both when they asked women um, about, you know, would you call yourself a feminist? And the number of women who felt uncomfortable with that label, even though they felt very, they, even though they said, you know, I believe that men and women should be treated equally. I believe women should, you know, should have full rights. I believe that, you know, all, so that they agreed with everything, but the term was something that was, you know, a, a difficult thing for women to claim. And then a lot of the men surveyed would say, in the, in the men's survey they did this year, would say, absolutely, I believe in, 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 in women being equal. I think women are strong. I think they're, they should have every opportunity. Uh, I don't know if I'd call myself a feminist. feminist right. And it makes me crazy because I feel like we should be so proud of feminism. Mm -hmm. Like feminism got us, you know, abortion clinics and women's health clinics, and it got us equal pay or moving towards equal pay anyway. It got us laws. It got us, it got us, um, you know, shelters. Um, it, you know, like feminism is an extraordinary intellectual movement, political movement, mm -hmm. creative movement. Like we should be so proud of what that movement accomplished. And I think, yeah, thank <laughs> you, yay feminism. Um, and I also think that we should like be able to use that framework. You know, it's I mean, it is an extraordinary framework mm -hmm. to understand power dynamics, to mm -hmm. talk about equality, um, to understand the ways in which we get. You know, uh, you know, the, we talked a lot in this past year about being gaslit. You know, about the idea of, um, you know, you know something to be true in your real life, but pe people keep telling you you're crazy. You know, the the idea that that the the guy in the office who keeps putting his arm on your shoulder, you know it feel, doesn't feel okay, but it's not, it's not anything, and don't get so upset, and all of that. And I feel like feminism actually gave us a language and a way to talk about these things and a way to challenge these things. And so, you know, you know I think when you, when you said, Garvey, I like, don't want to put it on, 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 on women, and I think, like, guys, go for it. Embrace feminism. Use it. This is a great thing. Like, like the, the, this is an incredible, it's, it's been an incredible movement, and the work is so far from being done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, men can be feminists. Like, we can all be a part of this. Yeah. Absolutely. And guys, if you're going to do it, you're going to screw up. It doesn't matter. You know, like, yeah, just mistakes, do it. Just get out there and do it. You know, I, uh, I used to tell a story about being on my hockey team, and we first got together like 10 years ago. And um, I was uh, with a bunch of guys I went to university with, and I was tying up my skates, I had my head down, and uh, somebody made a kind of, you know, sexist joke, a kind of rapey joke. And I was like, oh, that's pretty gross. But I didn't know what to do. I was terrified, right? And I was like, these guys are going to hate me. I'm never going to play hockey again. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get ostracized, blah, 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 blah. Came up with, you know, the most eloquent thing I could think of, which was with my head down by my skates, that's not funny, in a mumble, total mumble voice. And uh, it stopped. But the neat thing was afterwards, you know, two guys that I went out to the parking lot with were like, I'm glad you said something because I felt it too. Mm -hmm. But I was terrified. It's maybe the most terrifying thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to speak up in that moment, but you've got to do it, and you'll you'll see you'll see the benefits mm -hmm. of taking those steps. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You, um, Rachel, you've been immersed in this world mm -hmm. for uh, quite a few years now. Yeah, and you have a son, as mm -hmm. you mentioned. Um, what was the thing that you learned in this research uh, of this book that shook you the most as as the mm -hmm. mother of a, a teenage a boy. A teenage boy. Um, who's in this room somewhere? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't kid. want to point that out, but <laughs> Sorry, he is kid. here. <laughs> I won't point him out. Um, you know, it's a bit startling. Um, the ubiquity of porn in the lives of teenagers now is, yep. is 
you know, it, it, that's hard. Um, you know, there's been lots of studies that indicate that, um, you know, uh, that there's not a direct, um, there's not a causal effect between, you know, you know, porn use and, and sexual violence, or it's not as direct as, 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 as is feared. Um, but it's there and it's around. And I think we're not talking to kids about it. I mm -hmm. think, the, or we, the way we talk about it is to simply say it's terrible and it's wrong. And, mm -hmm. and but we're not giving kids the skills to to critique it the way that they learn, you know, media criticism. Um, and so that, you know, that, that, that was, that, was that, that, pretty, that pretty much shook me. Mm -hmm. um, but then in talking to some really terrific, um, you know, sexual health educators, um, you know, there's actually lots of great resources about how to talk to your kids about pornography, how to not shut it down, how to, how to have conversations with them about the images they see in all forms of media mm -hmm. um, in a way that engages them. And also kids are really media savvy. So they're, you know, I think the other thing that was as much as that kind of shook me, the thing that, again, I had to remind myself of, which was I was so aware of in doing the book, is how much agency kids have. I mean, kids aren't passive um, recipients of these messages from their culture. And boys are um, responding to these messages about masculinity as it suits their needs. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they know they need to kind of be a certain kind of way, and other times they reject it. And they are, uh, I mean, this generation of boys and young men are in a really interesting moment where in some ways they adhere to some really old fashioned traditional norms and in other ways um, they're incredibly open minded and um, there's lots to build on there, which mm -hmm. I, you know, I think when I think about things like, um, you know, just I, I think that the world has changed enough around kids that things that felt like I think even like queerness, like the visit mm -hmm. the, to be a visibly queer person, it is still not easy for for young people in schools. But I think it was diff it's different now than it was 20 years ago when there simply weren't any support. There were no gay, gay straight alliances. Mm -hmm. There was no visibility. There was nobody out in popular culture. Um, I think that that is a, um, a very different thing for kids now. And I think that kids are actually, you know, as Todd said, you know, you know, boys are really hungry to talk about emotions. Mm -hmm. And I think boys are really hungry to talk about, you know, about like, so what is going on in porn or what is going All on in it. pop culture yeah. or, you know, what, what is going on in this message I'm getting? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we just need to be more, you know, we need to meet them there. And be okay with it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was looking through my copy of your book, which I've been writing f furiously for, for months now, writing stuff. And, and I, there was this whole area that on the top, all it said was porn, porn, <laughs> porn, porn. And I thought, oh my God, if my 17 year old daughter stumbles upon this book that all on the more margins is this porn, 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 arrow, arrow. Um, but know this, and I learned this with my, when my daughter was 10 or 11, um, that they're exposed to pornography at 10 or 11 and you got to get your head around it you you, you mm -hmm. know you have to get the words in place to talk about it because they're going to talk about it at school and it's going to be all messy and stupid what they learn mm -hmm. and um you know it makes me crazy that the whole sex ed curriculum thing mm -hmm. is makes it's me bananas yeah. because at 10 years old I saw my history on my computer, and there was just a lot of porn, 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 <laughs> porn, 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 porn. Like mother, like daughter. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't mine. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> oh, how the tables have turned. Gary is looking oh, for the next so question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and you know, but it was interesting on that point is when there have been when there have been surveys done, um, lots of kids are saying they're turning to porn because they're not getting they don't sex ed. Absolutely, not, no one is talking to them about sex, and you know, this kind. I mean, all kids are saying it. LGBT kids say it a lot too because no one is talking about LGBT sex in yeah. schools. So you know, so kids are not getting accurate information, and so where they where they go is pornography. So if we aren't going to have these conversations with them, I mean, they're going to look at pornography, you know 
know, no matter what, because mm -hmm. you know, porn is fun and it's salacious and it's forbidden and it's all of those things. But they they are really asking us for guidance on these questions. They they really they actually. They I mean, kids might feel embarrassed when their parents talk about sex, but kids still want their parents to talk to them about sex. Mm -hmm. It was a great intellectual exercise as an educator until I saw the same search history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then it was terrifying, right? Yeah, of course. And and, and uh, what I've started to learn is actually a reflection of my own boyhood as well. I don't. I didn't. When I was a kid, I, I, I could understand the plumbing parts pretty quickly, mm -hmm. right? But what I really, really needed and I rarely got was um, the connections to intimacy and pleasure and emotion and love and feelings. And, you know, why am I walking around feeling like I'm going to throw up for two weeks because I like this girl in grade seven? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, on the old rotary phone dialing six numbers and getting on that seventh going, oh, <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Oh, really. <laughs> hit click, hang up, okay. You know, like that's what I needed. That's what I needed help with. And yeah. that's what I think we forget in the sex ed conversations. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, what we do have now is more focus on consent, mm -hmm. um, which was also completely absent from, from my boyhood for sure. Um, but, y you know, we have to be the courageous ones to say, it's not about just the mechanics and what you see online. It's it's about the emotions and the connection and the intimacy mm -hmm. that you experience with another person and yeah. um, those all those you know butterflies mm -hmm. that go on for seven or eight years or not absolutely <laughs> or, or continue forever yeah, 20, <laughs> forever thirty 40. years forever and ever <laughs> amen. Um, there is a um, I, we, this is my my sort of my last question mm -hmm. to throw out there and then we're going to throw it out to, to you guys um, and give you a chance to ask Todd and Rachel uh, some questions. <laughs> Pregnant pause questions. Um, but I, I, uh, we've all heard it uh, probably that the quote from Mr. Rogers who says in, in times of tragedy or crisis look to the helpers and your book is full of so many helpers, you know, those people that are going to, that are doing the work on the ground. And I think that's what um, has this book standing out to me amongst mm -hmm. so many other books that come, come on around there. I, I want to uh, ask you about the, the, the takeaways and spending time mm -hmm. with programs like Wise Guys mm -hmm. and Next Gen Men yeah. and, uh, you know, so many of them, it's just littered throughout. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of those, those takeaways and what can we do to support those programs? Yeah, so, there, so first of all, there are great groups. Um, you know, there are groups like Wise Guys, like Next Gen Men here in Toronto, and they also have a, an offshoot in um, Calgary, I believe they're, yeah. they're, they're, they are building, they're, mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Um, and, um, you know, uh, in, um, in Baltimore, I spent some time with a group called the Holistic Life Foundation, which is a yoga and mindfulness program mm -hmm. for all kids, but it started out as a program um, primarily for boys. Um, and they are, you know, they, they live, they, they do programs everywhere, but they are, they are housed in, um, in a school in a, a, a neighborhood that has a lot of, you know, struggles. It's, it's, a, it's a poor neighborhood, and they do, and most of their instructors are um, the boys that grew up doing the program. So it was three men who started the program, um, uh, two black men and a, and a Latino man who started it. They were meditators and yoga practitioners, and they um, started out by just finding young boys in the neighborhood and, um, you know, who, were, who were, they'd see at the YMCA or they, you know, <clears throat> doing sports neighborhood, and they said, you know, you know, we're going to do an after-school program with young men. We want to, you know, sort of be role models for young men. And then they started working with these boys with yoga and meditation. And um, when these boys were like 12, 13 years old, and now those young men are in their 20s, mm -hmm. and a number of them have come back, and they're now working at the school with the next wave mm -hmm. of of young men. And um, it is a remarkable program. It has lowered suspensions in the school. Um, I think there's often conversations about teaching kids grit, and I'm, I'm, I'm totally for that. But I think what this program also does is it tries to change the environment. It doesn't say to the kids, you're in a hard environment, so you need to find some, some, you know, some internal resources. It gives the kids some of that, but it also creates a network of supportive, loving adults around these kids who, who give the kids space to be 
children and kids. Mm -hmm. And I was super moved by that, that, by that program and the way in which it's become this kind of self-sustaining mm -hmm. thing. And so seeing these, you know, these young men who went through it, went off to university, came back, and what they want to do is they want to be back in the community and they want to help the next, the next, the next group of, of young men um, coming up. And um, so I think that, you know, it was interesting because a lot of people, when I was writing this book, and there'd be like this crisis, you know, these crises would come up, and, and I, I, I felt hopeful, and I continue to feel hopeful, because I actually got to meet so many people mm -hmm. that were doing this work with young men. So whether it was those guys, or whether it was, you know, this, this West Texas football coach who was like straight out of Friday Night Lights, <laughs> um, who, you know, was doing this great work with young men on a football team. And so it, was, it wasn't that at all, like it was, it was kind of, you know, spanning um, the gamut. I mean, there's great work that, you know, the organization You Can Play, which works in um, addressing homophobia in sports and being, in being inclusive in sports. I mean, there, is, there are all kinds of, um, all kinds of groups like that that are really trying to change um, the, the, the negative aspects of, of boy culture and mm -hmm. um, the way boys are raised. Can I just add one thing to that? Mm -hmm. Because I'm still learning how to be a feminist. You okay. And um, <laughs> I just want to encourage us all to not fall into this kind of uh, zero sum game mm -hmm. of uh, programming and interventions for boys have to come at the expense of programming for girls. Absolutely. And women. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're still working in a much broader context of inequality for women and girls. I mean, look at how school sports are funded, all kinds of other things. So we have to like, just not fall into this trap, which a lot of men want to take us down, like one or the other, this mm -hmm. or that, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that comes at the expense of programming and interventions for, sure. for women and girls, because sure. we still have a long way to go. Yeah, that. and, that's, and that's, that's a great point, because I do think that a lot of the conversation that's come up around the boy crisis is that, like, oh, girls are doing so well, and they're lapping boys, and they're way ahead, and the schools become feminized. And, you know, we know that's not the case. Mm -hmm. We know that, um, you, know, you know, girls are still experiencing and, um, you know, harassment and bullying, they're, they're, they're still not allowed the same kind of opportunities. Um, and you're right, this can be a, like, all of us can we be. We need a bigger pie, not a to bigger pie. fighting yeah, over the same yeah, Exactly, and we, and we shouldn't assume that it's just, like, this one pie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, that, that, that it's not a finite, like, like, our compassion and our resources are not finite. We can, you know, we can extend them. Thank you, both thank of you. you. Thank, thank you, Todd, and thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. Thank you.